Welcome to Ask the FM Doctor, an interactive web series brought to you by the Simplark Foundation and IFMA to help you navigate the complex and ever-changing world of facility management. Whether you're a seasoned professional or a newcomer to the field, you'll find valuable insights and tips to deliver a better experience for your stakeholders while saving money. Join us on the third Tuesday of every month at 1 p.m. Eastern U.S. time to learn from our FM docs while connecting with other facility managers from around the world. Register today at simplerfoundation.org forward slash FM hyphen doctor so you don't miss an upcoming session. Welcome and hello. Glad you're joining us for Ask the FM Doctor this month. And good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are located, we're glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Brian. I'll be kicking things off and we'll eventually turn it over to Michael Bound, who's online here with us to lead us through our teaching moment for the month. We're going to be covering what every FM needs to know about ESG. But before we do that, I'm going to start with a few introductory slides to get us started. So first up here will be a brief agenda uh, of what we're going to cover. So after these introductions, we'll have about 15 or so minutes, that's give or take, uh, as we go through the teaching moment for the day. Then we will break out into some virtual peer groups, depending upon total number of attendees we get to, we may stay in this one group and have a conversation about the teaching moment. Uh, it's possible we'll break out into a couple Zoom breakout rooms. Uh, we'll play that by ear, but likely we'll, we'll stay here in the main group together. Uh, after that discussion for our virtual peer groups, then we will have everyone back here. We'll open up conversation for any other topics that folks want to bring up, any other questions you have, and it will be another opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer networking and sharing. So that's the agenda for the day. Um, beyond that welcome, I also want to acknowledge the Simplar Foundation uh, as the research arm that IFMA is partnered with here to help deliver and organize the topics that we do here every month. And the Simplar Foundation also has partnered with IFMA on several other research efforts that you may see uh, IFMA releasing and launching uh, throughout the times. Most recently, uh, the Simplar Foundation and IFMA worked together on a procurement of technology for facility management purposes a report that was released, I believe, on Tuesday or Wednesday of last week. So check that out in the IFMA library for further details. Uh, beyond the Simplar Foundation, I think what we have next here on the slides um, is really launching us into a couple reminders. So reminder number one is in Zoom, if you go to the participants panel as shown, you can right click on your name or you can click that more button and rename yourself, put both your first name, last name there, maybe put your organization in parentheses so folks know who you are. Um, that's always helpful when we get into the peer-to-peer -peer discussions later on in the session. And with that, Mike, I think we are getting close to the end of our announcements, which means we we'll be turning it over to you to walk us through what every FM needs to know about ESG. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. This, uh, um, uh, I, I can't teach you everything an FM needs to know about ESG in 15 minutes. You need like years because it's still developing and it's not even clear what this is all about. But I have, uh, we've been doing some uh, some research into this at BYU uh, over this past year and, and I've learned quite a bit about it. And the more I learn about it, the more I realize how complicated it is. So I'm just going to focus on a few basic ideas uh, uh, surrounding ESG. And, and I'm going to need to do this from a U.S. perspective uh, there we have a lot of people joining us uh, from around the world here, um, but the U.S. perspective on this is not really U.S. based. It's just you hear about it a lot in the U.S. This you, you're going to see here in a minute that the what is driving ESG is an investment philosophy, and so this is uh, this is linked to stock markets and uh, you know an industry everywhere. Because our stock market, our, our markets are all linked globally now, and so I'm going to I'm going to approach it from a U.S. perspective, but it's going to apply to everybody uh, at one point or another. Certainly in Europe and Canada, right now, uh, it's it's uh, you know it's a big deal, and it will reach the other areas of the globe as well. All right, so here's what we're going to talk about. I've split this up into three basic sections. First, I mean just a real brief overview of where this even came from. ESG means environmental social governance. Okay. 
what on earth? Where did that come from? Then I'm going to spend a little bit of time about what it is right now because it has morphed a little bit since and you can see that it goes way back. And then I'm going to end up with where it's going. Okay. And uh, this is not entirely predictable because as do with future, but you know, we'll see. Anyway, where did it come from? Here's let's talk about where ESG came from. For a lot of us, it seems that this term has come up all of a sudden. I mean, I don't, I think, don't even think it's been a year since I heard this term. And I first scratched my head, what does that even mean? We were looking at sustainability and suddenly ESG pops up. What does that mean? It's the same thing? Well, it's not. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, ESG seems to have popped up. This makes us worry because, like, we've got bosses in a frenzy and what are we supposed to be doing with ESG? Nobody knows. Okay. Seems like a fad. Is this a buzzword? Well, yes, it is actually. But there is some substance to it. It's not something we can just brush off as the latest fad because it isn't actually a fad. It's just the term ESG is new. But this, what's behind it has been around for a long time. In fact, uh, it goes back centuries. And uh, while the term ESG has gotten kind of tangled up in politics here, uh, and, and is therefore likely to morph into some other term, uh, the, the, what is behind it is not going anywhere. And that's where we need to be aware and pay attention here as facility managers. Um, it is, if you've been paying attention to this over the past year, you will have seen that uh, it's gotten political. Now it's, now the left and the right are using this to bash each other over the head. Certain states are coming out with, uh, with dire warnings to people about misuse of ESG concepts, and it's, it's gotten ridiculous here. But the concept behind it is going to stick around for a while. Where did it come from? It came from the 1700s, right? 18th century. The Methodists in America decided they didn't want to invest in things that they didn't agree with, which were specifically liquor, tobacco, and the slave trade. And so they came up with this idea of not of, of value investing, but more in the sense of values, right? This was, they had certain values, this religious group, and they wanted to, they didn't want to invest in things that, like if today they probably wouldn't invest in Las Vegas, right? Because that's just in line with their values. And so this was a group, I mean, Muslims have certain values that they, they use for their banking and, uh, and the Methodists did already back in the 1700s. Well, that went on for a long, long time. And then in the early 1900s, the Quakers came up with this investment idea called Socially Responsible Investing, SRI. And they came up with an investment fund for themselves called the Pioneer Fund. And without getting into details, they described that as being, they were only investing in moral things, right? As they defined it. And so it was basically the same idea that has kind of gone through the, the history of the U.S. into the 1900s. This was during the Great Depression, of course. And then we move on to the 1970s. And there, this is, you know, this is the end of the Vietnam War, late 60s. Uh, you know, environmental concerns are starting to come up. There were three or four major SRI funds, socially responsible investing funds, that were set up to invest in socially responsible stocks, as they defined them, of course, right? Okay, but the main criteria from these funds, even though the funds have long since disappeared, the main criteria that defined what they were going to invest in have survived. And they are what's driving ESG today. And that is investing in companies that are not harming us, either society or the earth. These focus on social justice, they focus on corruption, they focus on the environment. And those three are ESG, environment, social, social justice, and Corruption, which is a, you know, which that's what governance is about, right? Avoiding corruption and that sort of thing. Okay, so that's where the that's where the ESG comes from. Then, about fifteen years ago, we're up on twenty now, the UN coined, actually coined ESG as a term in this document they published called Principles for Responsible Investment. Okay. This basically took this older trend that went all the way back to the 18th century and formalized it for our day, and it's still driving the bus right now. So ESG is an investment concept that now, over the past less than a decade, has started to drive institutional investors, particularly banks, 
to try to become more profitable while helping you know the environment while being sustainable basically that's what that's what this is about so it could be a win-win if it's done right the question is is it being done right and that's for history to decide but anyway that's where it comes from so that's the history what is esg now well there is some confusion now uh, and the confusion comes from the fact that the the big companies out there that we hear most about aren't even quite sure themselves I have seen on a couple of websites of Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies, uh, contradictions on what they call. They don't. So one of them didn't even know what ESG meant. They came with some other word for the S. I can't remember what it is now, but it was environmental something other and governance. And so it's kind of weird. Um, anyway, there's a lot of confusion around the terms, and it's exacerbated by the fact that ESG gets lumped in with other terms that we may know about and newer terms that are coming online now. You see these terms when you go through major companies' uh, reports, their annual reports, okay? For example, you will see sustainability reports. You will see corporate social responsibility reports. You will see ESG reports. You will see impact reports. And they all cover the same stuff. OK, uh, sometimes you'll even see the name of the report being one thing, but the URL using another word. So, for example, you'll see an ESG report and you look at the URL and it says, you know, dot, 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 company, something or other dot slash corporate social responsibility dot something or other. Right. So the name of the URL is corporate social responsibility. But the name of the report is ESG. They've changed the name of the report. Didn't get back to updating their websites. Right. So these things are kind of changing as time goes by. OK. Um, the problem here is that, the, like I say, the terms get used interchangeably, particularly I don't know if you can see my mouse. I'm circling sustainability here. In particular, sustainability gets lumped in with these other things, which is not correct. Sustainability is actually an overriding methodology that is used or should be used to manage other areas like environmental, like social like impact, like corporate social responsibility, and so on, right? These are not synonyms for sustainability. Sustainability is a concept that we use to drive everything. Like ethics is a concept that we, we use to, to manage everything. Sustainability also is a concept that we apply in various areas. We might apply it to the environment. We might apply it, we might apply it to our personnel policies, and so on, okay? So right now, ESG seems to be stuck or, or wedged between the, or, the older corporate social responsibility and what I'm seeing now as, as impact, corporate impact reports. Uh, those three words in there, and there's actually a fourth one that I didn't want to complicate this too much. But anyway, if you're in a corporation somewhere, you need to understand what your corporation is doing or is what, what the corporation is calling things. It's like your first responsibility as an FM here. Understand what the words mean. Um, and now what do we need to do as FMs, right? We're responsible for the built environment in the main. And what we as FMs need to do is, again, going to depend on your company. Um, but in general, we're going to have less to do with the S and the G parts of ESG and more to do with the environmental part. Okay, This should seem obvious because we're mostly managing the built environment. Our built environment, the buildings around the U.S. anyway, contribute to roughly 40% of our carbon emissions annually. That's a lot. Therefore, we, since we have our fingers on the, on the, on the pulse of, of, of these commercial buildings that we manage, uh, you know, there's there's room for impact here for us, right? Uh, and, and that's going to have to do with the environment. Um, but if you look carefully at the Fortune 100 companies, um, the minority of these companies actually go into detail on what they're doing with their built environment. Most of the companies spend most of the time in their ESG reports or their impact reports or whatever they call them, dealing with uh, S and G. Okay, they sp spent a lot of time focusing on their social policies, social justice, HR, uh, fairness in hiring and promotion, uh, gender equality, racial equality in hiring, all these things, right? Um, uh, and when it comes down to the building, a big chunk of the Fortune 100 companies really just present some fluff. 
they say, well, we're putting LED lights in. Yeah, you should have done that 15 years ago. We're upgrading our HVAC systems. We're, you know, fine. You should be doing that anyway, right? Um, there's very little time spent on uh, actual, ma actually making the building more efficient in a broader sense than what we've already been doing anyway as, as FMs, with one exception, and that is this right here. There were most of the Fortune 100 companies go into some detail on how they are trying to deal with renewable energy, either creating it themselves, like even on site with solar panels or windmills, uh, or purchasing it or investing in renewable energy so they can take credits for it. Okay. But this gets, this of course has to do with us, right? And here's kind of the point of all this for right now. Um, some of you may have heard of these emission scopes one, two, and three. These are definitions by an institute that doesn't matter right now. I mean, the name doesn't matter right now, uh, but it, they, they have kind of taken over in industry and we kind of focus our environmental our, our renewable energy efforts on scopes one two and three some of you will know what these things are already if not here's what they mean um uh scope one is uh, self-produced carbon emissions okay sometimes this is from using electricity it could be from driving your fleet or trucks delivery trucks or whatever anyway it's uh, emissions that we produce ourselves including the emissions we produce as fms okay Scope two is a similar type of emissions, but these are ones that we don't produce ourselves, but rather buy from our suppliers. Generally, this is interpreted as meaning electricity that we purchase, which is most of our electricity, of course. Sometimes it's heating energy that we may purchase in like a district heating situation or something like that. Generally, it's going to be purchased electricity. Okay? Scope one would be emissions from our manufacturing plants, from our travel, from things like that. Okay. Scope three is where it gets complicated, and that's because uh, scope three is everything else. Okay. Scope one is what we produce ourselves. Scope two is what we purchase. Scope three is our entire supply chain upstream and downstream. Okay. Well, what does that have to do with us? Well, um, first of all, we are responsible for, uh, to, to a great extent anyway, maybe outside of manufacturing, entirely responsible for uh, our use of electricity. It's in our scope. Uh, manufacturing might not be entirely, but maybe it is nowadays. Okay. Uh, we might be made responsible for our companies uh, for uh, non-FM related emissions. They may think FMs know something about emissions now. So let's just say the FM group is responsible for all of scope one and all of scope two. This is conceivable today okay scope three in any case is going to hit us because um we have suppliers right now upstream uh downstream logistics things like that we're generally not involved with but we have suppliers and they are upstream scope three for our fm operations and therefore also for our company right well, the problem is that when you start talking to your suppliers in fm about scope three emissions reporting from your perspective, scope three from your perspective, they're going to scratch their heads in a lot of cases. Now, if you have major suppliers, major cleaning companies, uh, maintenance companies, things like that, uh, they will know by now what ESG is. And they might even have systems for capturing their emissions. But a lot of our suppliers won't. Now, I know this for a fact because we've been doing some surveys and talking to talking to various, you know, well-established, but on the smallish side, they're really scratching their heads about uh, what this ESG thing is and scope this and scope that, okay? Now, the tricky thing here is that for our suppliers, we, we treat our suppliers as, that, that's scope three for us. But our scope three is their scopes one and two. But it's also their scope three because they might have suppliers as well, material suppliers or something like that, okay? So if we are focused, if our companies are focused on trying to reduce our scopes one, two, and three, you're going to be involved in all of them, okay? Um, your FM suppliers aren't going to know much about it. You're going to have to train them, okay? You have to tell them what you want them to report. Imagine somebody like Walmart 
they have suppliers of all the groceries that they, they, they get potatoes from Idaho, right? And, uh, and, or Albertsons gets, you know, gets their food from somewhere. That means all these little, little and big farmers, uh, uh, farming organizations are gonna have to learn how to report their scopes one, two, and even three to Walmarts or Albertsons as scope three uh, emissions for them. Okay, so for FM, we're going to have to train our suppliers in what we want them to report to us, but that's going to depend on what your company wants you to report as well. Okay, because you know all of our suppliers, everything. This is a chain of of emissions. Everything gets rolled up into your scope three emissions. Okay, and if you're an FM supplier, your scope three emission, your all of your emissions get rolled up into your your customers scope three emissions because you might have to report so if you're cbre or something or jll or cushman or you know you're going to be reporting all of your emissions to your clients like cbre manages wells fargo they're going to have to report their entire emissions to wells fargo as wells fargo's scope three right now the issue is that you're going to be for many of your suppliers you're going to struggle to get accurate data temptation might be to make stuff up to estimate roughly, you really have little, you don't have much possibility, you don't have many possibilities for actually auditing this stuff yet because metrics aren't really well defined. Okay, so you're gonna have to think this through. You'll have much more scope control of your scopes one and two, which is why a lot of companies still are really saying, well, we'll focus on scope three down the road, but for right now, we're focusing on scope one and two. All right, where is ESG going? This is my last slide, I think. It's hard to say, okay? It's going to be developing. I suspect that the word ESG will, will, will fade away at some point, will be replaced with impact or corporate impact or social, you know, whatever, whatever the new word is that comes. But the concepts will remain the same, right? It's going to, uh, there's the pushback from the, some of the states. For example, red states are starting to push back on this. Uh, blue states are not. Uh, they're... Uh, one state, I'm not, I'm not going to name states here, but uh, one state in particular was uh, threatened. Uh, they, they sent a letter to, uh, to the three ratings agencies, Fitch's, uh, Standard & Poor's, and Moody's, saying, don't you dare even think about rating our state uh, according to some amorphous ESG criteria that you can't even define yourselves. Another state sent a letter to all the big banks saying, if you dare consider cutting off funding from these major industries that are in our states, we're going to take you to court. It's turning into a battle. So don't know what's going to happen here, but the environmental part is not going anywhere, right? And so here's what you should take away from, uh, from this, little, uh, this little mini lesson here. Three things. Know what your company's position is on ESG. Find out what they're expecting you to do, right? Find out what you're, what you're going to need to report to your company and, 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 uh, because it's going to be part of your scope in the future. Um, only a part of ESG is FM relevant in most cases, right? And that is the emissions part from our buildings, okay? That's what we really need to be focused on for ESG for right now. And you will need to train your suppliers into being able to report scope there. To be able to report, your suppliers need to report your scope three, which is their scopes one through three, okay? So that's what you're going to need to, that's what I suggest you start thinking about and uh, try and get your mind around this, okay? Um, that's all I've got to say on this right now. Like I said, I could go on for hours on this, but this is, I think, pretty good for right now, just to get the conversation started. So I'll turn this back over to Brian. Any questions could come up, we can, we can have that in our group discussion. Beautiful. Mike, I'm going to go ahead and take over the screen real fast to show everyone a resource that Dean had put into the chat. Uh, so if you want to do further reading and check out what else IFMA has to say in terms of resources around ESG, check out that link that Dean put in there. Uh, a few things I'll mention here. Uh, Mike covered, well, I'll back up. IFMA does have a full seven-step process for integrating ESG into your FM operations. The very first one here is becoming more aware of ESG considerations, which Mike, Mike did a great job covering today, walking us through history and where things came from and, and also where it's likely going. And Mike's parting uh, thoughts on next steps around getting to know what your own organization uh, thinks about ESG, 
what responsibilities and expectations they may have fits perfectly into step number two of building a deeper knowledge and understanding of your own organization's ESG goals and ambitions. So check that out. I will mention if it looks small on your screen here of what I'm sharing, this uh, graphic uh, of the seven steps on the right-hand side, you can click to download the infographic and get further details there. There are a couple videos here as additional primers. They're both pretty short. This first one up here, introducing ESG is just a few minutes long, so not as thorough of a treatment as Mike gave us, but another perspective on it. Um, and then the seven steps, uh, there's an introductory three minute video there. Thank you for joining us for today's session of Ask the FM Doctor. Be sure to mark your calendars now and join our next webinar at 12 p.m. Central Time on the third Tuesday of the month. We look forward to seeing you again.